back to Open Federalist Papers discussion number four. Uh, today, uh, we will be, at, at the conclusion, we'll be over half done with the Federalist Papers and half done with our um, half done with our discussions. And today we looked at papers 37 through 44, next time 45 through 56. So we'll do 12 next time and then 11 after that each time until, or, well, until, until the end, roughly that. Uh, so we are, are looking at um, this, this series now where Madison is back uh, in the proverbial driver's seat and um, Alexander Hamilton had a, a long string and had been talking about uh, revenue and things like that. And now we're going to look at, at Madison and he's very interested in, in uh, talking about the convention, uh, the, the difficulties of the convention, uh, and then uh, how, how this all worked and why the Constitution was drafted as it was, the powers of the, the government, um, categorizing those, explaining those, uh, and how there was the uh, powers of the convention to form a mixed government. And if, does the convention actually have the power to do this? Uh, you may know that um, me, the Articles of Confederation were only to be amended by all 13 states. And uh, all of them had to agree, and so the Constitution said only nine uh, had to amend it. So it's always been kind of an interesting thing about the Constitution that it didn't strictly follow the, um, the Articles of Confederation's pre procedure for amendment or replacement. And so Madison has, has got to explain that and why that was all the proper procedure. And then, of course, as I said, getting into the powers of the, the government. So we just had about eight papers today, but they were a little bit longer than. than they had been on the average before and, and uh, got into some uh, reasoning about each of these issues. So is there anything that uh, jumped out to anyone about this particular set here? Well, one of the things is, is he's answering only nine of, he talks about how, you know, what is a majority? You know, we could have, could have a handful of states or just one state, which he says what represents one sixtieth of the population, stop this whole process. Question and he wondered how democratic that really was. I thought that's where he did a pretty good job in answering that uh, criticism that all 13 states should. Now, the question I've always wondered is um, what would have happened if someone had not joined? Were they going to be permitted to stay as an independent sovereign state? And what, what problems would that have caused? The big question to me is always is if you joined as an independent sovereign state, could you have gotten out? I mean, I don't think anywhere in here I've read so far where they said you were signing up for life. Mm -hmm. so, of course, that was the big argument in the Confederate States that the uh, movie uh, Gettysburg has a good illustration of that with General Pickett explaining that it was a, a club for uh, for men and some of the men started nosing around the other people's business so they wanted to get out and you're told you can't leave. You know, so, the, uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting, uh, real interesting issue that comes up you know, less than 100 years after these are written. Exactly, yeah. No, I mean, it, it is amazing how I, I, I see in these papers almost the foreshadowing of the Civil War and, you know, the, the, the regionalism that if we don't form this new government under this new constitution, this regionalism that could form and tear us apart, and that's exactly what had happened. And then they talk about how Confederacy is kind of a, a weaker form of government, and it was the Confederacy which had the weaker form of government that ended up losing the Civil War. Didn't they? I think they lost it. So was that uh, <laughs> <laughs> it depends on who you ask. I've met some people who will swear adamantly on anything and everything they can find that's holy that the South won somehow. Of course, I think those are the same people that believe the Soviet Union intentionally dissolved so that way they can take over America through the economy and thus win the Cold War somehow. I don't know. Yeah. So well, there are always all these uh, interesting alternate versions of history, right? <laughs> that, uh, that people hold to. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, so it's it's interesting that that uh, and the foreshadowing of this kind of stuff was was, was there. Um, and the way well, he, he, I mean, he, he also, I mean, kind of picks right up where um, Hamilton had left off about the urgency to do this, the importance of nationalism, the importance of stability, 
And, and, and that could only come from a strong national government. So it is just, it's really clear where these gentlemen are coming from, that they just believe that to keep this all together, that a strong national government was needed, and needed to preserve liberty. Which kind of seems like the opposite of what people may have thought when they truly believed in the way to protect people's liberties was through a strong national government. So I think it's a really real and, and he's, he's really trying to make the case for how, how this federal government needs to be um, needs to be much stronger than the, the Congress of the Articles of Confederation. It, um, it, it needs to bind the society better, uh, the, the various states together under a, a more secure system. And it's, it's really um, it's really pretty pretty remarkable how, how it just you know, keeps coming back to that. But this is the way we have it now. We're going to be exploited. We're going to be uh, carved up, and we need to have uh, some kind of a, a better, a better leadership at the, at the federal level. And he, like Hamilton, he's very good at using examples. In Thirty-eight he refers to the Greeks, um, and he points to other, you know, weak confederations that, you know, just simply aren't getting the job done. So it is again how mindful these these guys of history and uh, the examples that they point out of, you know, you know, look, we need to look at what has failed. You know, we, you know, we, yeah, we, he says, you know, we're not going to get it perfect, but we can look at those failings and improve upon them. Yeah, well, in 37, he, start, he basically starts out by saying, that, yeah, we've had our issues in the convention coming up with the Constitution, but we basically decided that instead of there being some sort of a strict line that can be followed to delineate where states have the authority and the national government has the authority, there is this massive gray area that we've all kind of agreed exists and we'll just deal with individual issues as they pop up. And then in 38, he basically goes on this, it's basically saying to some of the anti-federalists that Look, you guys with some of your arguments are really just grasping at straws. You need to understand that we've really thought this out and we've looked at what has come before and hasn't worked and we're trying to not do that as best we can. We're not just trying to take that and run with it and see if we can make it work. I want to point something out at the end of uh, 37. Um, maybe the end of the uh, penultimate paragraph there. Um, It is impossible for the man of pious reflection not to perceive in it a finger of that almighty hand, which has been so frequently and singly extended to our relief in the critical stages of the revolution. So very interesting. I mean, he's talking about the sort of ratification of the Constitution and how they're making steps toward this, this possibility. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in sort of asking the question of how ubiquitous this, this feeling was. Of course, it manifests itself later in the manifest destiny. But were the Federalists particularly prone to think of themselves as working in, yeah. in sort of a white divine right? Or yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think is that a, could you make a distinction between the anti-Federalists on this issue? And <sighs> I don't know if you could make a distinction there. I, 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 I think that to some degree it was a, a, a nationwide feeling that somehow God had this plan for them, and that they they were simply following that plan, and they were um, setting it, that that God was kind of on their side, you know. That yeah, I, there's, there, I think that was more of a nationwide thing. In the aftermath of the revolution. Yeah. Although admittedly, Jefferson, one of the uh, biggest anti-federalists, was somewhat anti-religion in many of his statements, sort of against uh, widespread organized religion, right. sort of dismissive towards Christianity. Right, but I, mean, I think they, they separated mm -hmm. God from religion. Mm -hmm. right. This was more yeah. of God in a spiritual sense, right. as opposed mm -hmm. to having some sort of strict religious canon that needed to be followed. It's kind of, yeah, Jefferson, you know, Jefferson called himself a Christian, but he sort of, I'm a true Christian, he said, you know, in a sense, I don't know if that's an exact phrase, but he considered himself a true Christian because he followed the teachings of Jesus, but didn't believe in the miracles. Um, and I, some of the work I've read about, you know, the 
religious uh, aspects of the United States, it, it, some of the public, or not the public, but some of the um, religious gains of the Great Awakening had kind of fallen off by the time of the Revolution. But through the Great Awakening um, and also the Enlightenment, you had two groups of people that sort of spoke some of the same language about God. Not all the same theological beliefs, but um, the idea that a, um, a free government was a Protestant government, was a Christian government, as opposed to Catholic absolutism that you'd see in France had been reinforced by like the French and Indian War. Um, you see in, in the Declaration of Independence and, and other, a lot of statements during the Revolution about, you know, this is, this is the will of God. Uh, he's on our side. He's, he's, he's helping us. Uh, and so he, whether someone was more deistic uh, or a more, um, more evangelical Christian, there's kind of this common sense of like providence in the sense that providence was, it was providence's will that, uh, that freedom triumph. And kind of interesting how the languages of like freedom and rights um, combined with the language of Christianity in ways that was different in Europe. It, it, Mark Knoll, who writes about this, he, he said that uh, in, in Europe, actually, most um, people who believed in a republic were heretics. Uh, whereas in America, most people who believed, or it was very common for Christians to believe in some kind of a republic um, and to believe in, in freedom. And so there was more of the kind of enlightenment religious synthesis in some ways in America that was different from a lot of places in Europe. So it, it, it's sort of like Christians and Theists or Enlightenment thinkers could sort of speak the same way about providence, and in a way that you could, you could almost see like Jefferson going, "Yeah, that's right," and uh, I don't know Timothy Dwight from Yale going, "Yeah, that's right." They're both of them saying, "The Almighty helped us out, but maybe being kind of different things by it." Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there was just always a sense that Americans had that there was something special about them, yeah. and, and that God was a big part of that, played a big part of that. Yeah, I, I saw that too. And I thought, oh. yeah, I mean, because yeah, the founders, I mean, believed that your rights came from God, so they uh, they clearly acknowledged an Almighty. Yeah, Madison was trained at. No, he studied at Princeton under uh, John Witherspoon, who was a. Um, it was a. It was, Princeton was founded to train reform uh, Presbyterian clergy, and so it, he studied there under uh, Witherspoon, who was like Presbyterian minister. Was I think. Pretty, pretty well in the evangelical camp. And I don't think Madison carried that on. Uh, it was very far into his adult life, but that language certainly would be something that he probably could have used equally at Princeton or talking with Thomas Jefferson or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that language is balanced, and I don't, I don't want to continue on this line of thought if no one else wants to, but this other passage I would like to just read briefly. Uh, he says, this is also in 37, when the Almighty himself condescends to address mankind in their own language, his meaning, Luminous as it must, must be, is rendered dim and doubtful by the cloudy medium through which it is communicated. Right? So there's a sense in which God is leading us, but He can't effectively communicate with us because we're frail human beings. Right? So I, I, I find that it's a very interesting claim. I mean, theologically speaking, you know, just because He does express a lot of doubt about you know the, the possibility of working together to. I mean, this, this, this project must have been on the edge of a knife, so to speak, you know. It's going to, are we going to ratify the Constitution or not? And there's a lot of, not suspicion, but doubt as to whether or not they're going to be successful. And it, it just always helps to have God on your side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody always wants God on their side, you know. I forget the exact quote Lincoln made during the Civil War. It was like, well, he can't be on both sides, yeah, because both of us are claiming he's on. Their side. In the, uh, in the second inaugural address. Yeah. 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 So, you know, and I don't know if, if Madison would have been a, a, a deist, but many of the founders tended to be a deist, where, you know, God just kind of set it all up and then stepped back and watched it all. Although, the, the, some of the, with the American kind of version of deism, you also get that kind of sense of providence kind of pulling for. But, yeah, I, I think my, my understanding is Madison was, maybe not as much as Jefferson, was something of a, a deist. He had, uh, I think towards the end of his life, somebody asked him what he thought about Christ. He said, I have, and the doctrine of Christianity said, I haven't thought about that in 50 years. Um, oh, we had the basis in it, you know. Um, but then there were some, you know, like Benjamin Rush was a little more evangelical, a little 
universalist uh, about the end of his life. And you see, they're just kind of different, different founders of different, you know, beliefs. But there certainly was, um, you know, uh, Madison and Jefferson were pretty, pretty deistic in a lot of ways. But there's, you know, if you read the Declaration, there's still that kind of sense that that God matters, you know. And so, I just read something yesterday that somebody kind of theorized that the God of American civil religion is kind of a um, is much more intervention prone than, than say the deist guy. So maybe that's kind of a particular American twist from the uh, Great Awakening or something. I don't know. Really interesting to think about. Yeah. Now, on, uh, what I liked in 39 was is that um, when he gives his definition of a republic, what is a republic? And, you know, he Capital letters like my angry students when they email me. You know, it is essential to such a government that it be derived from the great body of the society, not from an inconsiderable proportion or a favored class. And I kind of found that interesting because typically we think of Federalists as those who wanted the favored class to rule. And I and I, I would I would wonder, I would question him that when you know when you say, you know, by the great body of society, who who do you mean? Because, you know, we all know the, uh, that at this time only the property class could vote. So, okay. You think, now, Madison, he and Hamilton split, split pretty quickly. Sure. Yes. Do you think he might have had a little bit more closer to Jefferson? He, I, you know, I think, I think that might ultimately what tipped him to be more of a Jeffersonian than a than you know a Hamiltonian, but uh, I just thought it was very very interesting. Yeah. That, you know that he felt, and then you know he goes on in this one to explain how this new constitution does represent the people. You know, one of the complaints was, well, the Senate is chosen by state legislatures. He says, well, state legislatures are chosen by the people. Right. So he's always pointing out there's this indirect. Uh, form of democracy. Okay. It says in here, uh, it is sufficient for such a government that the persons administering it be appointed either directly or indirectly by the people. Yeah. So yeah. It's, there is an interesting, because at the beginning of 38, I mean, in establishing the republic, he seems to want to rely on the wisest and most able men possible. But once the republic is in, in, is in its function, I suppose, uh, then we sort of just rely on this process so that our leaders can actually be drawn from the people and chosen by the people. But like at the beginning of 38, you know, he says it is it is not a little remarkable that in every case reported by ancient history in which government has been established with deliberation and consent, the task of framing it has not been committed to an assembly of men, but has been performed by some individual citizen of preeminent wisdom. Yeah, so they kind of the, the smart people kind of right. set it up so that it will work. Right. And then, yeah, and that's interesting. Machiavelli actually says something really similar to that in uh, one of his discourses where he talks about, like, why it was basically, you know, very Machiavellian, why it was okay for Romulus to kill Remus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, hey, hey, you know, you never have a constitution set up by a bunch of people. It's always uh, Moses, like Hercus in Sparta, Romulus in Rome. This is how it's done. And I found it kind of interesting that he kind of echoed that right mm -hmm. right there. Yeah, well, it was kind of the same thing as happened with uh, Lenin when he tried to establish communism in Russia. He said that there will need to be this vanguard of people to kind of lead for a little bit and then set everything up. And then it'll just kind of take care of itself and it'll grow into this perfect system. But that, you know, when you have people in power, they don't want to necessarily give it up voluntarily. That's probably why the Soviet Union turned out the way it did. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I just, I always think that that is what's so remarkable, you know, is that these guys, in essence, kind of seized power. Yeah. You know, the Second Continental Congress had no authority to exist other than its own authority to exist, and the people that wrote the Constitution then did just kind of step aside. I mean, there has never been another Washington elected president. There's never been another Jefferson elected president. So it is almost like they did kind of turn it over to the people. And that, I think, is one of the most remarkable things about it. I mean, I think people can disagree, but I always tell my students it's like the only successful revolution in history in that regards. And that, you know, you get the 
this small minority that can tear down a majority fairly easily, but then turn power back over to the majority has always been the most difficult thing to do. You know, in Cuba, I mean, that's what Castro was going to do, and we're still waiting for that. <laughs>
they don't like the government, but right. the government doesn't like it <laughs> exactly. too much, <laughs> including the government that just got placed by the revolution. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You probably asked the Cuban dissidents about their right to revolution. <laughs> right. I just do what Fidel did. Yeah. Uh, but, or, yeah, like you said, the most just it's, it's interesting. Classic. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like that with the whole Enlightenment ideal, too, is they, they talk sometimes about how you can't really, once you start saying all men are created equal, and people that you can't contain that. You can't say, all right, but I just met these people, everybody else plug their ears, you know. John Locke, you know, writing about uh, second treatise in government, that the people had the power to overthrow the government. He didn't mean some, you know, fuller in, in a small town in England. He, he meant the, the great men of England and the, the property men, but he, he can't tell everybody else, just don't listen. And, you know, so those languages that are universal tend to um, be used in ways that people don't imagine. Uh, that, that right it seems like. And so you know, containing the kind of radicalism that is kind of a hard thing to do. Yeah, I mean, the, the French, after they issued the declarations of rights and men, when the slaves and what is today, Haiti, read that, they went, hey, doesn't that mean us too? And when the French said, no, we didn't have you in mind, they revoked it. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't turn out too well for the French, so. Can we speak to the difference between what he, what he calls the national government and federal government? Yeah, he <coughs> spent a lot of time yeah, on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I, I didn't really understand much of that language. Well, I mean, he, he does sort of... A, uh, traditionally, a federal government would be a government that would have like a, a central government and state governments each with their own distinct powers and then sometimes some overlapping power. But I think what he's referring to here is a national government as more of maybe an autocratic type government where the state governments have virtually no power. Yeah, so it would be not autocratic in the sense of one ruler. Right, not one ruler, but the national total government. centralized. Right, yeah, that's probably that would So like France today, right. in a lot of countries, yeah, they, have, they don't have local Outside of city governments, they don't have like provincial governments right. or Britain or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. They just have one strong centralized government. Because many people, many anti federalists, were concerned about the states losing their powers as states. And they were afraid that this new national government was going to usurp all of their authority. And um, many people fear a centralized government. States are still going to exist. There are certain things that they're going to need to do that the central government can't do. And federal comes from, uh, my understanding is it comes from the Latin word for faith. And so it's it's like a, an agreement, uh, yeah, and uh, like almost a covenant type idea um, that there's a covenant between national and state governments, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's kind of cool. Now, now many people today worry that we we have whittled away the state governments and that we that we are almost like a just one national or one centralized government because even if the, the national government the national government dictates to the states so much that there's just many people have tried to return to this federal system. You know, Nixon began it in the 70s, you know, we're trying to go back to this balance of you know, the national government takes care of some stuff and the state governments take care of others. Basically says 
it's like this, here's how, and basically it needs to be this way. It gives very eloquent arguments for having things set up that way. There was one where, uh, like, in 41, it's talking a lot about, uh, like, where, you know, how are you going to take powers that the states had under the Articles of Confederation and give them to the federal government under this new constitution, and how do you handle that without it becoming improper, and spent a lot of time in 41, and there was another one, I think it was, I forget which number it was, talking about the whole idea of necessary and proper, and that just by, you know, the government won't, the federal government will only take the powers it needs to, to run the country properly, and they will only take the ones that are necessary. So it's kind of like he's saying the, the meaning is in the message, basically. There's no real way to really look into it. It's, it's necessary and proper because it's necessary and proper. Well, yeah, well, in 41, you know, he says, you know, there's these certain things like security against foreign danger, regulating commerce with foreign nations, maintaining harmony, proper relationships among the states, you know, and he said these are things that a national government or the federal government should do, you know, and you know, security against foreign danger is one of the um, objects of a civil society, that it says, and that should then fall to the umbrella of the national government, because almost like, you know, we all, the things that concern all of us, the national or federal government should take care of. He almost kind of says like that's almost like a, a no-brainer to him. Yeah. That's definitely the sense I have. Like with the like spends a little bit of time talking about having a standing army. He's like basically says if you leave the states to have their own standing armies, then there's going to be way more people just sitting around with guns waiting for somebody to throw a rock at them, basically, and then everybody starts shooting at everybody else. But if it's controlled by the federal government, you have kind of a cooler head that's taken a few steps back and can look at the bigger picture. And then you have less people involved, and there's less likely of more minute, smaller, more incidental things that there's less chance of them being blown out of proportion. Well, when, when Washington became president, um, one of the chief concerns was the Western Territory, which the Native Americans were like, well, hey, look, you know, we didn't sign off on the peace treaty that said this belongs to you now. We're not leaving. Well, every state had a militia out there battling these Native Americans. People had formed their own private militias out there to battle Native Americans, and the West was really in chaos. And one of the things Washington had to do was bring this chaos, you know, under order.
national government needs these enumerated powers, but people were fearful that by putting that little clause that they can do everything necessary and proper to execute those foregoing powers. You know, Madison basically says, well, you know, the government would be essentially emasculated if we don't have this clause. And I, I think he responded well. There's a part in here where he was basically saying to the anti-federalists who were against this message, the idea of the necessary and proper clause, where he was saying, you're basically looking at it being as if we put this in there, then the worst of people will come out and they'll try and take up everything. And the Federalists were more, if we put this in there, then that will help the best of people who are going to be running the government do things better. Right. You know, if we, if we have the right to regulate commerce, we have to have the right to write the laws and do things all necessary and proper to regulate commerce. And he was saying this was just more of a way, this was more of a clause in his eyes, I, I read it as, to um, protect Congress's power to prevent someone from saying, no, you can't do that. And you know, he's, he's mindful, look, we're going to have good people there. We don't, we don't need to worry about this. The sections where it deals with uh, commerce and coining money, and the taxing imports and exports, I found really interesting because he's basically saying, like, I, I got the sense that he's, like, if today he would be, today saying this, he would basically be saying, why are you arguing with me on this? You've seen under the Articles of Confederation every state coining their own money and printing their own money and making it different weights and all of this and trying to tax, you know, having Virginia trying to tax something going from Pennsylvania to the Carolinas just because it's going down their roads. It doesn't work. There's too, you need to streamline the process and make it all even and fair. So a lot of the arguments he makes in these papers, as far as the enumerated powers, just to me it's like, it's like you said before, it's basically a no-brainer and why can't people see that this is kind of what needed to happen. Right. It's kind of interesting too, like, he even says that the uh, Articles of Confederation, technically Congress, there's nothing saying that Congress doesn't have these powers. It's just they're not using yeah, them. Or whatever. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. So it's really not adding this, you know, and I'm sure the anti-federalists weren't terribly convinced by that in a sense, but, but just saying, you know, it's not that Congress now isn't powerful, it's just it's not using it. We're not trying to set up a... Yeah, I thought, yeah, several cases he made that point of saying, look, you know, one, this power is already there, or it could be there if Congress would use it. And many of these powers, he said, look, the states have, and all we're doing is, in, 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 it makes more sense for the national government. So it's not like we're creating new powers, we're just shifting powers that the states had, to the national government because it just makes more sense for that. Well, one of the things I, I just found this kind of funny when I was reading in 43, he's talking about some of the, he's talking about some of the things in the Articles of Confederation that because the wording is ambiguous, it doesn't really make sense. And the one is talking about uh, admitting new states to the Union, and he says that basically the way the Articles of Confederation are written, that Canada could have been a state because it, you, through the use of the word colonies, it's like, you didn't specify that Canada wasn't included, so is Canada a state or isn't it? You know. Yeah, it's interesting. If I can I say a word about, I find that it's very interesting the association between liberty and happiness. But, uh, I think it was probably taken for granted. Uh, I think, because I think that premise can be questioned, the association of liberty and, and happiness, because I think when liberties are proliferated widely, you, there's a sort of, I think happiness can, can diminish actually, right? So when my choices become too broad, uh, there's a loss of identity, right? And so as, as my choices become more and more, uh, as they proliferate, right? There's this inability to make choices, right? Why? Wow. I mean, you know, you're faced with indecision. Um, and I think the, sort of the consequence, right, which is you know, the ultimate end of free speech, for example, is now this, this culture in which we live uh, that I don't think really promotes happiness, to be quite honest. Uh, it, it does, of course, but in, this, in another sense, I think it doesn't. So, and I, so I, I, don't, I don't know that these two concepts should be identified or, or so closely associated that they're not being identified. I don't know if you're looking at 41 or... Uh, well, I, yeah, sorry. But yeah, I, I was speaking to 
there's just general, general yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there is this, so I mean this sort of concern with happy the happiness of the American people, right? Right. And, uh, and that seems to be closely attached to the extent of their liberties. Right. And you can see why they want to make that move, uh, and I, I understand that move because it seems to be very important. To me. Uh, I have to be free to pursue my own interests, and the degree to which I am free to pursue my own interests has an impact on the happiness that I experience. But I think, again, when my liberties are proliferated, uh, that there's a, there can be this danger of losing sight of what's truly important uh, sure. and truly valuable. I, I mean, I, my thought is, and this is just my own thought, is that liberty was such a new thing at this time yeah, yeah. that I don't think anyone thought that it would come to where it is today where liberty, you know, has led to this, like you said, this, you know, this incredible proliferation of if it feels good, kind of do it kind of thing. I, I, I think their view of liberty would be much more narrow than what we have, for, than what we have of it today. I mean, liberty, I, I mean, I had a professor once tell me that the Fine Fathers basically felt you had the right to do whatever you wanted, as long as you didn't harm another person or another person's property. That, that that was essentially liberty to the founding fathers. That that you should be free to go economically as far as your talents would take you, and um, you were free from excessive taxation, the burden of taxation, and, and, you, and you basically just kind of had the right to be left alone as long as you weren't causing any problems. So I think this this new concept of liberty was, yeah, that. that I don't know, I wasn't alive back then, obviously, but I would think that it was pretty miserable to be alive back then. You know, if you were some peasant in rural England, I, I don't think your life was, I don't know. I mean, it just doesn't seem like what I have read doesn't seem like it was a very happy existence. And so I think they're looking at happiness maybe differently than what we look at it today, perhaps. But I think there are standards operative in the culture at that time, too, that were very successful at sort of you know, creating this atmosphere in which you know there, there were sort of standards, and I think those standards have largely been removed. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. Religious skepticism, for example, has sort of given rise to you know, a complete secular. Not that I am necessarily advocating a uh, religious life, but I think the, the, the uprising of a far more secular society has proliferated uh, opportunities that would never have been imagined. Yet, you know, when Oh sure, yeah, and um, a lot of the, uh, the the progressive movement, the, the Protestant reform movements of the late nineteenth century were about we are we are extending this this liberty, this freedom way too far. To it's okay to drink in excess now. It's okay to gamble. It's okay to go visit prostitutes and things like that. And um, yeah, I would I would agree with you that they probably never today argue almost that liberty is the ability to do whatever you want. And I don't think the, I don't think the founders would have saw it that way. Well, I, I think that this whole issue kind of brings up an interesting paradox in my mind because at this point it was like having the liberty to basically, you know, stay on your however many acres and do basically whatever you wanted as long as you didn't go out and, you know, cause anarchy or destroy other people's property not kill anybody or cause damage or harm to other things led to this expansion of you know people being able to do more just in general and then that led to kind of this idea of let's see how far these bounds go but then as you go out it kind of diminishes the happiness because then people start to see new and different things that oh well I want to do that or why don't I have this or how can I get that and it kind of then you have to kind of draw it back in. And consider um, on the idea of liberty and happiness being the same thing. These people have just gone for a war, and even now they're just barely managing to hold their new society that they're building together. And in a very uncertain future, liberty is this ideal they can look for, something to achieve. So in their minds, this is the greatest society you can achieve. It, something that would be worth all the uh, effort and suffering they put into this. Yeah. I agree with that. I think back then, too, that they operated with a much
much higher level of ethics than we have today. Given secular religion has no bearing on it. I mean, if you look today, you can see we have more liberties, but we treat them. I mean, we have we sometimes no ethical or moral consideration whatsoever. And back then, for them, it was like breathing. Most everybody, well, yeah, you can do this, but keep this in Sure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of interesting to think, like, kind of echo what Tom said. This was kind of the innocent years of the Enlightenment in a way that you had. I mean, liberty was going to be the next, you know, kind of guiding star of, you know, you got to get, get, get rid of all the, um, you know, the pretended kind of authorities, um, the artificial authorities, uh, have natural authorities that are really kind of rooted in nature, and, and uh, that there was, that this was going to be uh, the new foundation for a better society, so you can kind of see some of that in there, um, that kind of the hope, the hope was out there, and, and the experience wasn't there yet. Um, and the kind of more, more funnier thing is, is I heard, uh, apparently it's, it's pretty well documented that uh, consumption of alcohol was pretty high in the colonial period, but went way up, like, in the first part of the 18th, 1800s. And one theory for that is that now the pressure was on you to be the self-made man. Uh, before the revolution, you know, you had a place. You were this port in hierarchy, and the best men governed, and the uh, and everybody else kind of fell in place. And now it was, boy, this is all on me now, you know. Yeah. And the tempers came yeah. in. Absolutely. And um, and then the third thing is, is I wish I could come up with this myself. And this is, we'll see what you guys think about this as, as a summary. I was listening uh, about a month ago to, uh, or I was at a conference, at, and uh, Oz Guinness, who's a evangelical Christian, I think it was. Uh, Speaking, he, he said a lot of reading about the founders. He, he said that the founders kind of saw there was kind of a, a triangle of, uh, of, of freedom that they saw. There was the uh, freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith, which requires freedom. And so, but faith, he said, for the founders, some of them would have said, you know, it was Christian faith, some of them would have said just general kind of religion. So it, it wasn't one agreement that they were all saying it has to be. You know, a certain type of, of faith, but there had to be some kind of balance that freedom didn't work without virtue, and virtue had to be grounded in something. And that I thought that was a pretty good summary of kind of what the mindset was at the time, uh, because they were reading their Roman history and saw, you know, the, how the Romans saw the reason they fell was that they lost their virtue, and so um, it would seem that you know the idea of liberty and happiness, that liberty would be grounded in something, some kind of restrictions. Of, of uh, some kind of uh, boundaries, I guess, and uh, like the uh, John Adams quote about the Constitution is intended for a religious and moral people, and so there would have to be some kind of guidelines. They probably saw that coming more from like the civil society, whether it's churches and, and um, you know various organizations providing that morality. I would see that maybe as kind of how they might have thought of it. Then liberty was more political liberty, economic liberty, as opposed to maybe social liberty, social liberation. You know, certainly you were in a civil society expected to act in a certain way. But it's interesting to think about this idea of self, you know, you know making yourself into something. And that's precisely what I was hoping to sort of highlight is this inability to sort of situate myself, right? And this loss of identity, which I think, you know, again, when, when choices become, uh, when there are, it's just a, a choices available to me that were not available to me initially, then it's very difficult to, you know, make myself and sort of what what, what principles am I going to appeal to? Well, I think part of it too is like you said with this new economic freedom to kind of you're no longer stuck doing this job because your father did it and his grandfather did it and that's what you're born into so that's what you do now that it was the onus on the individual person to see how far their talents could take them. I think that also while they were getting to that point where they could no longer achieve any higher, they could see the people that maybe didn't climb as high as them and that they both had to work hard. Somebody got to be a little bit better off so maybe they should kind of make up for some of that difference through charitable works or just being civil and courteous and just 
like a general like idea of just common courtesy amongst all and everybody being generally peaceable towards each other. I think it's uh, interesting you talk about ethics. I think it's I think it can be a trap to to think narrowly as as if this group of people uh, can be you know that we can transpose that to the larger group that we have now because I think when you talk about ethics, um, liberty, tolerance, um, are we talking about everybody? No, we're talking about a certain group of people. We're not talking about those Indians that you talked about on the frontier. Uh, these are very intelligent people who can write quite well and are, are uh, you know, uh, bringing forth some very interesting uh, new ideas. At the same time, they're perfectly comfortable with slavery. Sure. So I think it's a trap to think that somehow they were more ethical or that we lost I think, it, I think we could look at it as almost a, a maturity. Uh, you know, they, they, uh, they, they're on to something. They're trying to define, uh, you know, rules and, and, and ideas that will guide people. It's almost like sustainability. What can we, it's amazing that they can anticipate every contingency and try to set up a, a set of rules that will sustain itself and work for people and uh, take into consideration every possibility and every type of interest. Um, but I think that there's a, 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 an immaturity at the same time. Certainly, um, even if there are discrepancies in ethics, that doesn't prevent a group of people from believing themselves to be more ethical or more tied to ethics. But it still is an interesting point that any claim that any claim by anyone of ethical superiority or a certain morality invested in their system is really just using one arbitrary uh, set of ethics. Um, I mean, as we spoke of earlier, the difference between the uh, heretics and traditional Christians and their views in both America and Europe. These are different values at work using the same basic guidelines. Now, you know, like in, in like reference to slavery, at this exact same time, the country was having a national debate on slavery. I mean, there were many people, including Southerners at this time, who um, were big believers of the Enlightenment, big believers of John Locke, that all men are created equal. And, and, and you know, it, it's almost like there's this teetering point in which slavery in the whole country might have been abolished. I mean, it, it, it comes, you know, very, very close because obviously it gets abolished in, in the north. So it, it's it's almost as if they 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 missed an opportunity because there were certainly uh, white men who did not have property who were also arguing that they should be allowed to vote. They should be allowed to participate because they had fought and bled in the, in, in the revolution. So it, it, this great experiment in democracy has evolved over time, and I think that this is where the beginning of that evolutionary process began. Whereas uh, some people, and I, you know, I don't know Madison well enough to know, but many people felt that uh, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness were more less for people who would enter civil society, as they would put it. Whereas others were out there arguing, look, this should be everybody. So, I mean, that's, I mean, this is where, you know, the great debate began. And, you know, we do start off with just rich white men of property voting. But that was the only place, nowhere in the whole world could anyone else really vote except for a handful of people in Great Britain. So, I think, I think it's interesting to look at it like a programmer, you know, they started this program and then later you have a, a time when Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address and he addresses it again and says, you know, we're here, we had a, a serious malfunction right? and, and we're at a point now where we, we're looking at this and we're saying, can this, does this program really work or doesn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, that, I mean, this, 
the essence of that address is, look, you know, 87 years ago, you, you started a nation that said all men are created equal, and you're not living up to that. And we need to start living up to that. And that, and that you know, that, I mean, I tell my students, I said, if you just wake up every day and tell yourself, I'm going to do my part to make sure that everyone in this country does have equal opportunity, we'll be a whole lot better off. Because that was, that is the guiding principle of what this nation is supposed to be. We just have never filled, fulfilled that really, I mean, high ideal that, you know, we all supposedly subscribe to. The women's rights movement, you know, they'll, they'll quote the Declaration of Independence. The civil rights movement will continue to quote it. I mean, I mean, that, that, all men are created equal, I mean, just really, you know, is the beginning of this movement toward, you know, really all men being created equal. It's interesting to think about, like, the culture, uh, I think, American culture today, American culture this time, probably at that time there was more local cohesiveness, probably had a stronger kind of, be able to replicate or, or pass on values more shared values in a community. Today, we're more fragmented in the sense of, you know, can't agree on it as much as probably it is at that time. And we have more opportunity to see that we can't agree on as much because we have mass media to be able to see what right. somebody in Michigan is thinking about doing when they're going to vote or whatever, you know. Uh, and most, you know, probably one thing everybody can agree on is everyone has a right to his or her own opinion, uh, but not as many guidelines as to what that opinion might be and what some good balance of that opinion might be. So there's less, there's more, there's more freedom in the sense of like more autonomy, not as bounded by the strong cultural institutions of that time, but at the same time, you know, some of those cultural institutions, obviously like well, slavery as an institution or you know later segregation, where you know, nobody misses those, right? So it's, it's interesting to think about like how fragmented our, our culture is in a lot of ways, but also how nationalized it is, you know, where it's probably more localized, but stronger at that point. So I thought it was hard to well, you know, know, compare. It's very interesting to think about. I, I mean, I don't know the percentage, but the, at this time, excepting African slaves, um, most people in this country were still primarily British. Mm -hmm. And so it was easy to have a shared culture when virtually everyone was from the same country. You know, the problems where we start, you know, having problems with people um, challenging traditional American ideals is, well, the Germans come and, well, they'll drink beer on Sunday. Uh, you know, then we get the new immigrants after the Civil War who don't want to learn Right. They, they, <laughs> they don't want to learn English. You know, they want to dress differently. And, yeah, and, and so it was probably much easier to have a cohesive um, common culture at this time when you know the vast majority of the people were united under were one from one place and they shared that culture. I mean we still share certain ideals like liberty and democracy and things like that, but once we get, you know, away from those few common ones, it's you know, we have a lot of problems. slavery at the time the Federalist Papers were written. Like you said, you see it kind of as a missed opportunity where they could have maybe gotten rid of it in 1789 with the Constitution. I think it was more of, I don't think it was so much a missed opportunity as it was kind of an uphill battle that they tried fighting, but at this point it was just too steep of a hill to climb and get over, so they put in the point about after 20 years after the ratification that the importation of slaves would no longer be illegal. And they even said in here that basically the government would do anything and, it's, anything and everything in its power to basically make it so expensive so that people wouldn't want to do it even if they believed in the institution. So I think it's one of those things where they, they had a goal, they saw they wouldn't quite be able to reach it at that time, and they tried to put the initial steps in place to kind of get the ball rolling so that way maybe somewhere down the line other people who had more means or maybe a different way of looking at it would be able to kind of get to that final step. 
Well, in, in, in Peter Colchin's book about uh, American slavery, he talks that even after the Constitution was ratified, there was still in the South that debate going on about should we live up to the ideals of the American Revolution. And then by 1820, 1830, it's become a peculiar institution because the South did not ultimately choose to emancipate or end slavery. And that's why it gets this name, the peculiar institution, because most Western societies had abolished slavery by 1820s, 1830s. It was just a handful. Just a couple left Brazil. So, to, yeah, Brazil, um, yeah. Cuba, Cuba. This was still Spanish at the time. Yeah. So, the Spanish colonies, right? Yeah. Basically. So, uh, Mexico, Brazil, Mexico, 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 Mexico abolished it shortly after. Oh, did they? Okay. okay. They probably never had that. Many. No, they never really did. No, yeah, most of Latin America abolished it pretty quickly after. Yeah, so it's interesting. So like, it was rather uh, extreme in Latin America as well. I mean, there were certainly very harsh conditions for slaves in the South, but I mean, in Brazil in particular, uh, they shipped in millions more slaves, and the life expectancy of a slave was much, much less, like around a month. They just throw corpses in ditches, and they were done with them, buying a new slave. But there was a, what they call in Brazil, a liberal movement to that, I mean, shortly after their independence from Portugal that wanted to liberate the slaves because slavery was being seen as a as a deterrent to progress. Right. You know, that you know, we, we need to move beyond this. And this for whatever reason the South just kind of stripped largely out of racism and economic needs, just kind of closed ranks and decided, nope, can't do that. And that's because they started making the argument that slavery was a positive good. It was interesting, you know, it was so hard for, it was a bit dividing them, it seemed to be, right, like, uh, societies that depended on slavery, right. it was just very difficult to, well, maybe Britain would be one of the few uh, countries that got out ahead of just acting against some sense of economic interest and right. abolishing its Caribbean colonies, but, yeah, with the South, with Brazil, yeah. it was easy for Mexico or, or easy for the northern states to abolish right. slavery, it seems like, because they didn't have this absolute dependence yeah. on them. Like, but I, but I don't it's easy to be good. Not, I shouldn't say. I shouldn't say easy. Depend on the area. I shouldn't say easy, easy, but easier. Easier, yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't think we should also overlook that there were people in the north who genuinely felt that slavery was wrong. Oh yes, yes genuinely yes. felt that it oh, was yeah. wrong and it needed to be abolished. But yeah, it certainly made it much easier when yeah people's economic livelihood was not dependent upon it as it was in the south. Well, I think. Trying to round it back to this section of the Federalist paper, like a lot of this section to me was kind of challenging the people who were against the Constitution to kind of step outside of their comfort zone and think about a new idea or think about an idea in a different way that hadn't been tried before and don't just discount it as oh well it's never been done before so it's not going to work so why should we try it we we have this system it does okay but. You know, we know how that works, so let's stick with it. And I think they, they tried to include slavery in this as one of those of trying to convince people that along the lines of, you know, everyone's saying all men are created equal, that means all people, period. And there were just some people, especially those in the South, <coughs> that just were gripping too tight to the slavery as an institution and didn't want to let it go. So they kind of had to try and start steps to eventually get it abolished and hope that in time people would come to see that it was not something that was worth continuing. People are afraid of change. That's a good way to conclude. I, the, uh, next week we're going to, two weeks I should say, we're going to look at uh, papers 45 through 56 and we're going to start getting into a little bit more about state governments versus federal government, sort of how those powers are balanced and then um, into Congress. And I know Congress only has a 10% approval rating or something, but this will be more, this will be uh, more to your approval, I think. All right, so thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.